goes without saying that pretty much every character in the Psychonauts setting has suffered a trauma in one form or another. Whether it be loss of a loved one or parental abuse, they all have scars. Arguably, one character has been the conscious target of abuse more than any other, Dr. Calagosto Lobato. From a young age, he has suffered through more than you can imagine, and even to this day, he is having his mind twisted and warped by the will of others. I think it would be fair to say that despite being the most reoccurring antagonist in the series, he's also the greatest victim of them all. Victim, however, does not necessarily mean innocent or harmless. Let's go back to the beginning. During Rhombus of Ruin, we enter his mind and find the first of three mental vaults for this character. Lobato grew up in a well-off and seemingly loving family. His father was a medical doctor and had high hopes that the boy would follow in the family business. His mother suggests other high-end professions such as an architect or a lawyer. However, after mentioning dentistry, his father laughs it off like it is a shameful thought for his son to be a dentist. Even at this time, the infant Lobato shows signs of psychic ability, telekinetically bringing his stuffed animals into his crib. One of these toys, a manatee, makes an appearance throughout the story as a figment in Lobato's labyrinth and an expression he uses. I hate to be so blunt, but you have the insanity of a manatee! I know. These psychic abilities go largely unnoticed until he is older and caught bending spoons by his mother. She freaks out, and after dealing with a child that wasn't as perfect as they expected, his parents take him to the hospital to be examined. Doctors determine the source of his psychic abilities and suggest an ice pick lobotomy to cure him. While hiding in a closet one day before the procedure, Lobato hears his mother first wonder if the surgery would hurt him before expressing that she does not care if it does. She began to view him as tainted, a devil child. As long as she does not have to deal with the psychic boy anymore, she could not care less what happened to her only child. I have fun at the hospital! I know they'll take good care of you there! Why isn't he leaving? Just keep waving. The little monster will give up eventually. Ah, soon we'll be free of this devil child. The young Lobata was lobotomized, and with this, his mind began to fray at the seams. From here, let's move forward to the events of the first game. Lobato is now grown, having taken on the mantle of the dentist and brain surgeon. The mad doctor was contracted by Coach Oleander to steal the camper's brains and create an army of death tanks. He genetically modified animal life to serve his purposes, and emotionally torments his assistant, Shigor. An emotionally abusive doctor who makes alterations to others to serve his purposes. Sounds familiar. What could have happened between the sensitive boy and this lunatic to shape him into a twisted reflection of his own father? It may be an example of extreme mimicry. This is defined as the behavior of observing and replicating the actions of others. It can be a conscious action such as when a salesman tries to develop repertoire with a customer to secure the sale. Or it can be unconscious, like a child mimicking their parents' behavior and speech patterns. Dr. Lobato is a caricature of how he views his own father, twisted in the same way Oleander views his father as a butcher, and Raz views his father as a psychic-hating zombie. Both work in the medical profession, sure. More specifically, his father believed a lobotomy is the only way to cure the afflictions of the mind. The brain sneezing powder was developed for this purpose, to cause anyone he determined to be unwell to literally sneeze out their brains. This is a reflection of how his father removed part of his brain to cure any perceived afflictions. In his own vernacular, halitosis is the word used to describe emotional or mental instability, whether it be real or simply imagined. Halitosis in dentistry is simply chronic bad breath, which among other things can be caused by bacterial infections. The mental disorder his father perceived became symbolically linked in his head to this oral infection. And what do you do with infected teeth? You rip them out. This methodology became a twisted reflection of the lobotomy he was subjected to. Nearly everything he says when making a diagnosis is paralleled with his own personal experience as a child. If something is wrong with the patient, cut it out. Unfortunately, this is only the start of Lobato's problems. By itself, this would be enough to put him on par with other patients at Thorny Towers. But let's go deeper. 
Why did Lobato wrap himself in the imagery and behaviors of a dentist, but act like a brain surgeon? It comes down to how he views himself as compared to his father. Keeping that in mind, let's pause and shift to discuss Eric Erickson's theory of psychosocial development. Proposed in 1959, it details eight stages of development throughout a person's life. The first four focuses on social development, and the second four focuses on egocentric development. Stage four of this model is called industry versus inferiority, and generally ranges between the ages of six to 11. Coincidentally, the age range Lobata was when he suffered his emotional trauma and brain surgery. Per Erickson's theory, each stage involves a psychosocial crisis. If overcome, the individual develops. If the crisis is too much to handle, they can remain stagnant and develop a complex. The main focus of this stage is fostering a feeling of competence in the child. The feeling that you can accomplish goals. Failure to do so can create an inferiority complex in the child. To quote from his work, During the industry versus inferiority stage, children become capable of performing increasingly complex tasks. As a result, they strive to master new skills. Children who are encouraged and commended by their parents and teachers develop a feeling of competence and belief in their abilities. Those who receive little or no encouragement from their parents, teachers, or peers will doubt their ability to be successful. Not only did Calagosto's parents give him an insurmountable task of becoming a lawyer, a doctor, or an architect, but they actively joked that anything less than this, like becoming a dentist, would be considered failure. Withholding affection for failure is a terrible thing for a parent, especially when the child is unable to live up to such insane expectations. These parents were even worse, as they would show outright disdain for failing to meet their standards. This only puts fuel to the fire of his sense of inferiority. So it makes sense that Dr. Lobata would wrap himself in the garb of a dentist while attempting to emulate a brain surgeon's behavior. The dentist is the failure in his parents' eyes, but through mimicry, he attempts to become the doctor, the only achievement worth anything according to his parents. This may explain why the trap laid for him at the start of Psychonauts 2 involved giving him an award as Employee of the Year. This small form of recognition was enough of a hook for him. I, I've never won anything! I've been on a vacation! It would also explain his distress when learning it was a trick. It is important to note that mimicry has its dark root in a sense of inferiority. As people, we don't try to mimic the behaviors of people we consider inferior to us. We only mimic people we consider superior to ourselves. In Lobato's head, his father is superior to him, so even though he feels like a failure as symbolized by the dentist, he tries to mimic the doctor. We have one last topic before proceeding. While researching this video, I looked into the possible side effects for lobotomy. Dr. Antonio Moniz received a Nobel Prize in 1949 for his procedure. It was later further developed and popularized by Dr. Walter Freeman. Dr. Freeman coined a term for those who had recently gone through a lobotomy, surgically induced childhood. He believed that many would regress to a younger mental state into what he called an infantile personality, but claimed it was not permanent. This included reports of reduced capacity to focus, significant decrease in inhibitions, and loss of empathy. It was so common that Dr. Freeman would instruct the caregivers to treat post-op lobotomy patients like children, regardless of their age. This included suggesting they hold down the adult, spank them, then give them ice cream after. By observing Lobato's behavior, we can see some of this. Impaired focus, check. Decreased inhibitions, check. Childish personality, check. Loss of empathy, check. This last one is the focus of his mental world in Rhombus of Ruin. Once inside the mind of Dr. Lobato, Raz finds himself on a boat with a projection of Caligosto as the first mate. A giant sea monster taking the form of the mad dentist is assaulting the ship threatening to destroy any form of safety. The compass on the ship's deck is missing, making it impossible for Lobato to sail to safer waters. Raz correctly observes that this is his moral compass that was lost long ago. The last sane part of this troubled mind is trapped on all sides by a beast he cannot escape because his morality was lost somewhere along the way. But where to find it? Inside the mental vault, the young psychonaut dives through the memories to witness the emotional abuse and the lobotomy from the doctor's past. 
This compass, the symbol of his lost sense of morality, is found in the cradle back when he was an infant, before life influenced him, before the psychological abuse and the surgery, back to a time of innocence. The scene changes once more and we find a young Lobato sitting in the bathtub. The shower curtains match the pattern of the cap he wears. It is not confirmed if the scene happens after the lobotomy or before, but in his head, the man we see now never let his mind leave this safe place. During the battle with Monster Botto on the boat, if you look up, the shower head and curtains can be seen. Trapped inside this bathtub, frightened of the madness until his moral compass can be returned. The relevance of the bathtub was foreshadowed back in the first game. During the Brain Tumbler experiments, we witnessed the bathtub in a hall right before the Thorny Towers. This is positioned right before we meet Dr. Lobato for the first time. Now that Rasputin has the compass in hand, he gives it to the lost boy in the tub before diving back down into the boat. The monster recedes beneath the waves, the sun comes out and he's able to reclaim some form of empathy. Back out in the rhombus of ruin again, Dr. Lobato says he feels like a cavity that has been filled. He expresses remorse for his actions in the moment. However, it becomes quickly apparent that all of his issues have not been fixed. First, he releases Truman from the Silurium, but then orders the entire facility to self-destruct, completely disregarding the safety of everyone still inside. Luckily, the Psychonauts are able to escape and capture Lobato. While on the way back to the Mother Lobe, it becomes apparent that his father is not the only person who left a permanent mark on his psyche. One oppressor is enough for anyone, but inside his head, Raz finds a second. I stated at the start that Dr. Lobato has had his mind twisted by the will of others, more than one. While his moral compass has been returned, the scars of the other traumas are still in his psyche. A scar that keeps him in line, despite the doubts that now plague him. We'll explore this in part two of this character's mindscape in Lobato's Labyrinth. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed, please drop a like and subscribe to receive updates on future uploads. If you would like to help support the channel, a Patreon has been set up and the link is in the description below. Have a great day and peace be with you all.